right. Uh, we're going to call uh, this uh, June 17th meeting of the DRB uh, to order. And um, before going too much further, Meredith's going to talk about our remote meeting procedures, um, and then we'll get going. Awesome. Okay. Let's see if I've tweaked this enough so I don't have to get up again and go play with the projector. All right, there we go. Um, so for anyone viewing tonight's development review board meeting over Orca Media, you can participate in the discussion via the Zoom platform through either video or telephone access options. If you want the full video experience, you can type this link into your web browser. Um, and I will get a little notification that you want to get into the meeting and I'll let you in. Alternatively, you can dial in using this phone number here. And when prompted, put in this meeting ID. Um, and again, I'll get a notification that you want to get into the meeting. Um, if anyone is trying to get in and having problems accessing the meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. Um, and if you start having issues with lag and stuff, actually turning your video off can often make the sound quality much, much better. Um, for everyone attending, please keep your mic microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will help reduce background noise. Um, and you know, if you do wish to speak, please uh, raise your hand um, and wait to speak until the chair um, has called on you. And the first time that you're called on, please make sure to state your full name um, and either affiliation if you're here representing a application um, or your address if you're a member of the public providing comments. Um, please reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions only. Um, questions or comments about an item on the agenda um, should be dealt with verbally by raising your hand and then waiting to be called on. Um, if the public is unable to access tonight's meeting, then I would get notification of that via my email. Um, it will need to be continued to a time and place certain. I will now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so, uh, I'll just re reiterate, we don't have too many members of the public on, but, um, we, uh, you know, we expect everyone on their utmost behavior, uh, at this meeting, um, any questions, uh, come straight to the chair and then we'll direct it, um, where it needs to go. Um, and, um, you know, if, uh, we have issues with, uh, people over, overrunning and talking too much or unruly, we'll end this meeting and, uh, continue it to a, uh, a time and place, uh, certain to, to try again. Um, that's, that's our, our move. I don't expect, uh, to have any of those issues this evening, uh, but we're just, uh, keeping it, keeping it standard here. Um, uh, so obviously Sharon is no longer, uh, or she's here. She's not here this evening at this, uh, application. Uh, so I'm Rob, the vice chair be filling in this evening. Um, and, um, introduce, uh, board members here starting. Meredith Crandall, staff. Uh, Rob Goodwin, chair, vice chair. Our last member. Captain Burgess, member. And, um, uh, my... And Joe Kiernan, board member. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Um, so we will um, uh, make one swap here, given that um, the uh, you know, Vine Street applicants that don't appear to be here yet. So um, I would accept a motion for the approve the agenda um, with that swap of Vine Street and Berlin Street. So moved. Second. All right. Motion by Alex, uh, second by Catherine. All those in favor? Hi. All righty. We have an agenda. And um, I guess we'll start with the um, Berlin Street applications. So you all can uh, come on up. And yet, don't forget to speak into the microphone as okay. best you can um, so that our minute taker can <laughs> take appropriate minutes and so everybody remotely can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so the, the Martin Quadros and Susan Quadros were here for the application for the Duncan project. Um, I'm going to have my civil engineer, Jeff, uh, go over it and present it. Wonderful. Um, okay. So before, yep, before we uh, get too far, we are going to swear anyone in that will be testifying on this application. <laughs> um, so um, 
who do we have um online? Is it just Jeff or anyone else? Yeah. Um we have somebody from Lajanas as well. Uh, yeah, this is Michael Lejeunesse. Yeah. All righty. So we got two on the um, Zoom platform and two in the room. Um, so uh, those interested in providing testimony in this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn as a witness? Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I will. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Meredith, you want to start? Or you want to have Jeff, Jeff start? Sure. <laughs> what would you prefer? <laughs> I can do just a quick little procedural thing. Right. So, um, normally this application would just be approved administratively. Um, I would handle probably helping, you know, going back and forth with Department of Public Works on certain items, and the administrative permit wouldn't necessarily be conditioned. It's just that. I wouldn't issue it until the applicant and DPW agreed on some of the finer points in here. Same with like stuff about some of the trees, things like that. Um, but there's the a waiver for a loading zone location. So that had to come to the DRB. So some of that back and forth is just noted as red text in here where ultimately the board needs to make the decision based on the comments that came in from DPW and um, you know how the applicant feels about those comments. So there might be more conditions on the permit that you guys would approve than I would do, but it still works out to be about the same situation except for that loading zone area. Wonderful. Thank you, Meredith. Any uh, procedural questions before we start getting forward? Um, okay, uh, we'll we'll turn it over to the applicant. You feel free to have Jeff talk or okay, you talk, yeah. however you want to. Yeah. yeah, and I'm happy to chime in here. Uh, so just for the record, uh, my name is Jeff Oleski with Catamount Consulting Engineers, uh, the civil engineer for the project. And um, what we're looking at here is, uh, for those of you familiar with the Dunkin' Donuts property, and I know Meredith's usually pretty good about pulling up some plans so we can kind of talk through this. I'll, I'll just give a really quick overview because I, I think there's just kind of a, couple sticking points to go over with the board, but I'll, I'll give an overview of what the project involves. Um, but uh, the existing um, Dunkin' Donuts facility on, on Berlin Street or Route 2 um, currently has an existing entrance and exit split by kind of a, a, um, a small uh, brick median, so to speak, um, and it does have a drive-through component to it with vehicles entering the site and working in a counterclockwise fashion around that building and then exiting out uh, the other side. Um, it's a uh, certainly a small lot. Um, the existing property is just over a half acre. Um, so it's pretty uh, narrow and, and not overly deep. And so there's certainly some physical limitations associated with that property. And there have been, um, which, which this application is really seeking to uh, improve upon. Um, the, the primary one being that there's really a lack of queuing space for drive-through vehicles um, on this property for the drive-through component. Um, and it sometimes cause congestion both on-site with parked vehicles and pedestrians, as well as sometimes under busier hours in the morning and evening uh, bleed out and cause traffic to sometimes queue out onto Route 2. Uh, and so recently, the property to the south, uh, which was uh, the previous auto repair shop, um, and the specific numbers are... are I'm not sure. I think it was 57 and 59 Berlin Street was that property in the south. But ultimately, it, it came up for sale. And uh, so DeMartin's got a, a contract to purchase that property contingent on permitting. And so uh, we have recently uh, filed an amendment application with Meredith uh, to merge these two parcels into one property uh, with the intent of raising and removing that existing building. Um, so as Meredith pulls up this up here, that's the auto repair shop building to the south on the bottom portion of the property. That uh, larger rectangle on the north side is the existing Dunkin' Donuts. And so um, really what we're looking to do is, is, again, remove that existing auto repair shop building and then take the, what in my opinion is kind of three existing curb cuts on Route 2 and reduce them down to a single curb cut um, and, and provide a lot more queuing space on, on the properties in total once the project's all said and done. So, as in Mary, the scrolls down here, uh, what you're looking at is the kind of an overall proposed site plan where the new curb cut would be about uh, be a kind of traditional uh, AOT 30 foot wide commercial curb cut on the south side of the two combined properties. We would have one entrance in where Meredith is pointing now, and then there'd actually be two exit lanes, one to the left and right. 
Um, and then the curb cut that was on the north side of this property or the auto repair shop would be closed off and, and revegetated, which is the area Meredith's highlighting there, as well as the existing curb cut that serves the Dunkin' Donuts now would also be reclaimed and cut off um, so that ultimately we'd be re reducing the amount of the access points out onto the roadway, which obviously will, will benefit the, the uh, flow of traffic and pedestrian and vehicular safety on Route 2 in general. Uh, but then the other uh, benefit now is with vehicles entering on the south side of the, of the properties, combined properties, they'll pretty much have that whole frontage now um, to kind of queue there. Uh, and as they get to the drive through, which is exactly right where Meredith is pointing now, that's where you order from. Currently, we're not proposing any changes to the building. That area she's circling now is where you actually pick up your um, coffee or food. Um, and so we're not proposing any changes to the functionality or the uh, circulation around that Dunkin' Donuts. We're just trying to reconfigure the parking, reconfiguring the access and providing more queuing space. And I think generally everybody's acknowledged that this is certainly, although not perfect still, um, given the, the lack of depth we have in this property um, and kind of understanding where, what to work with the existing building and, and the way it's laid out internally and whatnot um, is, is still a pretty good benefit. Um, as Meredith alluded to, I think the main reason we're in front of the uh, DRB tonight is for this loading area um, that she's highlighting right now. And, and so the intent is, is where we have the curb cut, the existing curb cut, more or less um, paving, keeping a part of that paved and hatching that off um, and designating a kind of a loading spot. And um, the way, and, and there are, I will acknowledge there's some larger trucks, tractor trailers that do come in for deliveries um, to this site. So we need to make an attempt to still try to accommodate that. And what happens now, as I understand it, is that the tractor trailers kind of just pull into the entrance and up along the south side of the building and kind of just block traffic in kind of all directions and kind of get in and out of there as soon as they can. Uh, but that also causes some congestion on property as well as, as some complications at the entrance and exit of the facility. And so what we're trying to do is designate an area on property where tractor trailers can, or larger delivery trucks can pull into the site, pull over, get out of everybody's way, uh, do their loading and unloading. Um, and then for larger, uh, just kind of standard box trucks, we would imagine that they would kind of do a three point turn where they back out there, yep, and then just pull back out the way they normally would. Um, for very large uh, tractor trailers, um, we kind of envision them either backing in or pulling into the site and still using utilizing this loading area, but then probably having to do a, a similar thing depending on the amount of vehicular traffic and space available on property. Um, you know, depending on when and when they're when they're doing their deliveries. Um, we looked at a lot of different options as far as how to get trucks in and out of here while still, um, you know hitting the other goals of trying to provide more queuing space and improve vehicular and pedestrian safety. And this is kind of the best layout that we could come up with. And in addition to the loading space that we're requesting there, we'd be relocating and, and enclosing the dumpster trash recycling dumpsters into that darker shaded box there for easy accessibility uh, for the trucks that um, pick up the garbage and recycling and then adding more parking on the south side there um, that would mainly be uh, employee uh, parking on that far end. And then we'd have some more dedicated parking along, yeah, that area there uh, for customers. Um, the overall parking, although I think it is just at the maximum that we're allowed based on the zoning requirements, um, I think is, is you know, it's, it's not significantly more than it is there now, but as an improvement from a layout and functionality standpoint, um, given the tightness of that site right now. Um, I, moving on to the staff comments and our conversations with Department of Public Works, um, I believe the city arborist has reviewed the landscaping plan and has signed off on uh, the species where we've selected like an autumn blaze maple. Uh, there'll be uh, ultimately five trees are along the front, those three, one on the south side of the entrance and one more there. Uh, that we felt were uh, nice street trees, provided some aesthetic break between the parking areas and the street, but at the same time had doesn't really have lower lying branches to impact site distances. Um, we did note Meredith, uh, the, the arborist request to change some notes on those details with regards to the removal of the burlap bag, and we have no issue making those changes um, as part of uh, the revised or final plan set that, that gets submitted to the city for approval. Um, Moving on to the lighting, we are proposing some minor changes to the site lighting. 
uh, namely relocating one light that currently sits between the two properties on a fence line. Um, we relocate that light pole to just the north side of the dumpster enclosure because there's kind of a crosswalk there, our, our painted um, uh, access point uh, along the kind of connecting the dumpster enclosure to the building where we envision pedestrians utilizing that cross hatched area as uh, pedestrian access. Um, so we'd have a light there and then two lights in the south parking area strictly as a, a security and safety measure. Um, we did note also in the staff notes that there was a concern about the color temperature, um, making it a, a warmer light color temperature in the 3000 uh, Kelvin range, which um, again, I've talked over with the applicant and they're comfortable uh, revising not only the proposed light fixtures, but also updating uh, the existing light pole on site with that same light fixture to be compliant. And I, I believe if we agreed to the terms, the site lighting would predominantly be in, in uh, as proposed in uh, uh, in conformance with the city regulations as regards to lighting. Um, and then I think the last thing that came up from a comment from city staff or the public works was uh, really relates to the line striping on Route 2. Um, you can kind of see portions of it now. The, the line striping shown on Route 2 on this plan has been updated uh, based on site survey and the new Route 2 repaving efforts that were just done last summer. Um, so right now there's uh, th there's essentially three lanes on Route 2 here. And we're right at a point where we're the, the, the middle lane transitions from being two lanes northbound to two lanes southbound. Um, and uh, there's a comment from Public Works because of the relocation of our curb cut, uh, they'd like us to see a, a shift in that line striping so that the two lanes northbound started a little sooner so that there'd be, at, yeah, at the access point to the, the, the relocated curb cut, even though there's a curb cut there now, because it'd be used so heavily um, or, or theoretically more and more use that we'd essentially stretch the and shift the two lanes uh, the transition a little further south, uh, which we've reviewed out in the site uh, in, uh, on property on Route 2. Um, I don't think there's any other implications or ramifications in that. Uh, I've talked over the applicant. Again, they're comfortable. Uh, the city has uh, made the gesture of, of providing that restriping plan uh, if the applicant was willing to implement it or pay for the cost of, of um, grinding out and restriping a portion of this. And I think it amounts to maybe I'm guessing probably 100 to 150 feet of, of restriping potentially in this new curb cut area, but uh, they're amenable to that and we, we don't see any issue with it and think it makes sense as well. Um, so sorry for the long windedness, uh, but I don't think there's any other really changes, utilities, size of the building, employees, none of that's changing. It's, it's really just to improve parking and functionality of the site. So I will now turn it back over to the board with any questions. Great. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. You. Um, and take care of um, some of the, the easier ones first. <laughs> I think it's uh, overall, it's a, you know, seems like we have an area that everyone knows has got some congestion. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think the goal here is to, is to, you know, is an improvement. It's very clear in every way, shape or form. Um, um, just as is on top of my mind. So, um, Alec had suggested um, he made the root ball recommendations. Did he have any recommendations about um, as far as like excavation of soil um, or um, any like subsurface, you know, work um, for the trees? I don't recall seeing any notes on that, uh, Mr. Chair, but I, I do note that our detail for, we have a, a tree planting detail within the plan set um, that does call for certain depth and material of sub-base material. So we're not just putting a root ball in gravel yeah. um, or pavement. So there's a certain amount of soil expectation there. So we can, uh, you know, theoretically assume some mature trees maintain their, their health for the foreseeable future. That's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, and um i guess it'd be good to get like a general you have a general idea of uh you know as far as the tractor trailer delivery versus the box truck delivery it seems like the tractor trailer is not something that happens every time yeah no it's twice a week it comes the tractor trailer comes twice a week twice a week yeah and then the box service every time they don't it does yeah yeah. <laughs> they change them over at the board. <laughs> and then is there additional box truck deliveries throughout the week or 
Uh, yeah, usually the donuts, our uh, donuts get come from Shelburne, so but that's usually done like at midnight, I gotcha. late night. So okay. that's really, really the only. Is there any other? Yeah. And uh, our compost. Yeah, our compost. And then the trash, but that's early morning, like yep. before 6 a.m. So not enough to impact anything really. Um. Okay. So one issue flagged in the staff report was the um the distance um of the curb cut to the driveway on the south um being um you know 30 30 feet um <laughs> it seems like the configuration here uh, <laughs> we're making a significant improvement and i don't i don't i would agree with the staff report i don't think it seems to be a big issue it's, it's you know. the neighbor weighed in i kept on looking for something from the neighbor oh we no we got no neighbor comments everybody got mailed out letters um with the public hearing notices but we didn't have any public comments. actually we met with the neighbor today so i actually brought him over the the plan and so he was he was good with it good. he was coming over actually to talk to us because he was having some uh he said there was some issues he thought we already owned the property some issues with some transients like sleeping behind the building and if it was okay for him to call the police so <laughs> i recall that house is set back to yes it is literal. yeah it's not been... And for what it's worth, uh, just to follow up on that that response to that comment, we did measure the um, distance from the throat of the new proposed, the south edge of the new proposed uh, curb cut to the north end of the existing curb cut. And we get about 31.7 feet, which I believe is greater than 30 feet that DPW was looking for. And yeah. also note that we're reducing, we're actually pulling the curb cut in on the south side there in 10 feet, because it's about 22 feet now. Um, the way the gravel, it, it's kind of a very funky configuration on that, um, you know, that auto repair shop. There's actually a gravel parking area to the south of that building or southeast of that building that it has a curb cut that kind of just blends in with, because right now the, the curb cut for that auto repair is almost really the whole width of the frontage. Um, we're calling it two separate ones because there's kind of in and out the way they were parking cars, but the way the grading works there, it's it's all pretty, pretty open, but. Anyway, I, I do think we, we meet the intent of, of uh, DPW's comments there. All righty. So, yeah, so now the big question, the regulations indicate that the loading zones are supposed to be, you know, in the back of the building. Um, I think what we've all seen here, uh, there's not a way to do that. <laughs> the loading zone is not currently at the back of the building. Uh, there's no other way to do it, and uh, um, I'm I'm okay with approving that um anyone else have any ideas i have some questions that aren't about the loading zone i mean i think there's nothing i mean what's being proposed for a loading zone is better than what has been happening yeah. when you go out at eight o'clock in the morning and there's yeah. cars speed up on route two or the 18 wheeler is across three lanes <laughs> <laughs> so there's no question that that's an improvement um, I do have two questions, though. Um, one has to do with, which was raised in the staff report, a tree buffer that would extend in front of, between the loading zone and the sidewalk. Now, and on your, on the, I don't know what they're called, on the diagrams, that's mm -hmm. part of, that's like a pullout for the truck, right? Yeah. It's made in. Yeah. So the, the thought process there a little bit was, um, you know, we're in order to accommodate that loading zone without impacting the queuing capacity of the, you know, of the drive through there, we only end up with about four feet of width of green space between that loading zone and the edge of the sidewalk in the, in the right of way. Um, and only about a foot and a half of that is actually on property as opposed to being in the right of way. Um, so we just had some concerns about, uh, the viability of, of th anything actually taking there and staying, uh, yeah, that, that kind of crosshatch area is the area we're looking to reclaim. Um, and so we've got a, about a foot and a half on property and two and a half feet within the right of way with that darker dash line being the approximate property line, uh, in this area. Um, so th that's why we kind of folk. And, and then on top of that is understanding that that's also the section of frontage of Route 2, where you are looking at the Dunk Donuts building, the signage, the outdoor patio area with some landscaping that's in front of the building and whatnot. 
And so we didn't want to necessarily do anything to impede the, the view of the building. And so we focused our landscaping efforts in the area that was going to screen, potentially screen the uh, proposed parking area. Um, I, I don't think we're necessarily against adding something, additional landscaping uh, in the form of maybe some small grasses or bushes there. We, again, we just have some concern given the lack of width between pavement and, and concrete sidewalk, what would potentially last there long term. I hear you. I hear you. It's also, though, uh, Eat Island, I think is what they call it. I mean, walking along that sidewalk is brutal. Yeah. Um, and and the, and I'm sure some of your traffic is pedestrian. I mean, yeah. um, so anything that can mitigate that would be a plus. I mean, a tiny plus. <laughs> yeah. a plus. Oh. And it could be tall grasses. It could be compost grass or something that, you know, grows five feet, wouldn't impede the sign or recognizing the building. Um, I mean, I don't know what it might be, but something to, okay. at least to put up for discussion. Um, and the second thing has to do with the pedestrian access, which is cross-hashed across the two, what are now the two properties from the um, from the garbage, new garbage area to the building. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't realized when I first looked at this that the parking, the 10 parking spaces on the old Caraval Golf side were primarily for employees. I thought they would also be for um, customers. Um, what's the material of that? Is that just painted tarmac or is that going to be you know, like brick or something that indicates it's really meant for pedestrians? Yeah. I think I believe the intent is everything you see in light gray on the plan there would be pavement and and either full new construction pavement or I believe the intent is also for the existing pavement around the Dunkin Donuts to be shimmed and overlaid so the end product here will be a full new pavement layer across both sites in total uh, with that cross hatched area that that Emeritus is highlighting right now being a, a white painted crosswalk uh, on top of the pavement. And then, yeah, the same thing. Right now, the south side of the existing Dunkin' Oats building is hatched off there, too. Um, that's really just to make sure cars don't park there. Um, and that would probably be maintained because we still don't want vehicles, you know, thinking they can park there, understanding that there's cars coming out of the drive through and going right around that corner. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, the goal is to just really delineate and designate a pedestrian safe area from those six parking spots that could be used by uh you know clients um or customers and direct access to the front door of the dunkin donuts and knowing that's there and then at the same time we've also designated our ada compliant parking space adjacent to that crosswalk area so that there's they have that freedom on the side to uh, comply with the ada requirements and so presumably that painting that indicates it's a pedestrian zone will be updated on a regular basis. Yeah, it has we the do. habit of we do seasonally. washing yeah. out. Yeah. Any other board members have any follow-up to Alex's comments? Okay. Joe, you got anything? Nope, not at this time. Right. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the shade is a is a valid point. Um, I think, but I think in the grand scheme of things, we're getting one, two, three, four new, you know, full size trees at some point. Five, five, five right. new. Four of them along the sidewalk. Four along the sidewalk. Yeah. Um. You know, a a, a significant improvement from the. The current uh, situation when you look all the way down Berlin Street, <laughs> right? Um, so we're, we're we're making progress for sure. We'll have a little sign. Um, you want Meredith, to yes. Go south. Um, you could always sort of give them the option and the conditions to have that be a parent to have some perennial beds in there. You know, and if it's in, you know, if it's an optional thing, then if they can do it and find find something that would grow there well, you know, perennial or annual beds. Um, but it doesn't have to be a requirement. But that way, if they add them in, it's not needing to come back to me for another zoning permit because they've changed the landscaping. Uh, uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, because there's, well, like, there's one that makes corner sense. there where there's a little more space, but it's near a tree, so you don't yeah. want to put another shrub there and impede, yeah. 
you know, impinge on the tree's ability to get a good right. root system going, but you could add put perennials or annuals there. Right. Yeah. Um, that would add a little bit more screening so, if it's something a little taller. On the principle of reducing the line of share of bureaucracy, we could put it in as a possibility. You can put it in as an and option. And if you could figure out a way yeah. to make it a shade tree and keep the building exposed, <laughs> that would be. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but but that that gives them a little option without having to get another permit. Good. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to cause trouble that way. I mean, it, you know, there's yep. no point to that. And if by some miracle that pedestrian crosswalk turns into brick as you're laying it, <laughs> <laughs> um. that would just be an administrative amendment without another permit. It's not a substantial change. Lighting. Um, any proposed changes to lighting? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there. I saw the cut sheets in here. Oh yeah. Well, Gary talked about the um, temperature of the lights, but the, that one light height yep. doesn't meet the setbacks. I think it's approvable, but right, it's one of those funky ones. I was confused on that with of how the light is uh part of the setbacks. Can I ask, can I ask a clarifying yeah. question? Hmm. There's a point in here around how the um the lighting is being added for customer safety. Um can you remind me or remind us what the hours are for um hours of operation? Oh, uh, 5 a.m. to uh, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Just one other quick thought, uh, Meredith. As I, I believe when you're referring to the light pole non-conforming, that you're talking about the new one on the far south end to the, with the afford parking spaces. Is that correct? Yeah, because the spacing from the property line, technically, it I don't think it complies. But right. it's also one of those, you know, you got to have it where you need it for security, for staff, yeah. and for night deliveries. And, and one thing I'll just point out, if it helps the situation any, is that the, there's a pretty significant grade change from where this light pole base is going to be installed to even where that driveway is on the south. There, there's not a residential house or anything directly adjacent to this. It's, it's actually a, a longer driveway that goes to the southwest. And there's about four or five feet of grade change there right off the bat. So even though we're calling for, I think, 20-foot pole, it's really going to be like 15 or, or 16 feet above that driveway grade. Again, I realize I'm I'm just arguing maybe to argue, but it's just something to factor in as far as, you know, I understand the concept being you want the height of light pole to be at least equivalent to the horizontal setback from the property line, I think is the intent of the rule. But uh, it's just tough here when we're trying to create as much queuing space as we can on the site, that's all. In that light... Is it, or maybe it is proposed to be shielded, so it's only going. Um... Yeah, all, all the light fixtures are LED downcasting, fully shielded light fixtures. But but it's shielded. Meredith, go ahead. Sorry, the setback situation, I yeah. think, is more of a, in case the light pole falls, it doesn't land on someone else's property, yep. fence, house, person. Um, is what that setback has to do with is that's a safety thing more than a light, like light, right. light pollution issue. Um, but you know, I can hold on one second. I can pull up a Google map street view of that too. Yeah, I think that is. Sorry, give me just a second because it's harder on one little bitty screen to do all these things. All right, so right here's the back of the existing garage building. 
and this is the drive the neighbor property and it goes right up the hill so the light is the light gonna be somewhere around where the back of the garage yeah, is yeah right it, it's it's kind of very close to that front corner yeah uh where you see the cmu kind of blocks and that red roof it's near the corner the, the light pole base would be near that corner yeah it'd be about here so yeah it'll end up if it falls it sort of gets propped up on this bank here right the known unknowns yeah the unknown <laughs> exactly <laughs> Um, well, falling light poles. I never thought of it. And it was set back. It is set back. <laughs> you got insurance? You got insurance for that, Demarin? Uh, nope. <laughs> it's one of those items where it's not something that pops up in my head either when I'm first going through an application until I get to a staff report where I'm having to go through yeah. every single line. And I go, oh. <laughs> um. Sound like I mean, it doesn't sound like we have a whole lot of ability to to waive it. I mean, it's pretty clear, you know. It's like the idea is that we've got our, our um what ten percent potentially. Uh, if you're talking about a setback, yeah, you could do is... that. I hadn't considered that waiver. There is the for other for dimensional. Hold on, let me go back to the regs. How do we go? I don't really go into the detail on that one. Okay. I mean, there's also the, you know, I don't know what, what kind of safety codes apply for the amount of lighting that they need there for the parking lot that would be outside of zoning. Yeah. Right? So if there's federal and state security requirements. Um, I, mean, I, I can't say this. I mean, if it became a, um, you know, a deal breaker or a specific issue with the board. I mean, we could relocate that light to the southwest side of those four parking spaces and then turn it 90 degrees. So it's kind of out going out over those four spaces from the southwest. And at the same time, we would probably then take the next light um, over those six parking spaces and maybe shift it one space left um, and kind of redistribute the light from that perspective. If, if we thought that would, if, if we thought we couldn't get a waiver or, a sign off and having that light pole there. Um, alternatively, we could also drop the height down on that light pole um, to a level that, you know, uh, it, again, it wouldn't have the same, quite the same effect, uh, but it would, it, you know, if we got that up to 10, 12 feet or something like that, uh, could probably still provide enough illumination level f to feel safe over those, because we're only talking about four parking spaces here. It's not a huge area. Um, so we could call out that light pole specific um, to be just a little shorter than the rest, if if that's something the board would entertain. Not a huge risk. This... Yeah, I mean, it's also just, you know, where the board has discretion versus where it doesn't. Right. So there is, there is a, um, in section 3002, board may modify any dimensional standards in these regulations. It doesn't say provision, it says regulations, by not more than 10%. So there is a 10% waiver option, um, which would apply to Actually, this kind of setback. Um, as well as the having that light pole maybe be a little bit shorter. If we can, you can get there to both of those. So that could be a condition of approval. I don't know. Do you know what that would get us to, Jeff? Well, so the light pole base is shown right now is... Uh, just over 10 feet from the property line. Um, I guess it depends on how you want to calculate that 10% waiver. <laughs> <'Cause> so, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're right, you can go you can go down or up depending on how you want to look at that. I mean, just thinking more about it, it's like 10% doesn't really do too much because it's more of the height of the pole and how far it is right. from the property line, regardless of what the setback is. Um, it seemed like your your proposal where you were talking about you know, you that got that tree in the south uh, west corner there. Seems like you both the light and the tree could find a happy place near each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, so if we center that that light pole on that, uh, you know, the parking space that has the four circled around it, Meredith, um, and then rotated at ninety degrees, 
Um, yeah, and sent a light towards Route 2 for those four parking spaces. That, that pole base, that would be over 20 feet from the property line um, yeah. and ac accomplish that same goal. And then again, the, that next light pole to the northwest, at that point, I might shift that, yeah, to there just to kind of equally distribute the light in that area. Um, I, I don't know what DeMartin's thoughts are on that. I mean, I think it yeah, for some reason, I think we had that light originally that one we're saying to move there yeah. we might have already had it there originally so yeah i mean it's, again hard. it's it's That'll not work. quite as aesthetically pleasing and and um you know uh equally spaced but again i think for the purposes of 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 lighting that this parking area up uh for the few hours in the morning and night that you need it i don't think it's going to be a, a you know an issue necessarily Would that satisfy the board's concerns about this if we were to have the final plan reflect those changes? That's a much easier solution than 10% uh, waivers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm good, but just to clarify, when it comes to the... Um, paint striping of Berlin Street. Um, is that something that we would just condition you to work with Public Works on coming up with a plan for? So we don't have that specifically in here. Yeah, I think I, and I'll keep, let Meredith weigh in on this. I mean, I, as based on the conversations we've had uh, with, with Corey and, and email correspondence with him and, and Meredith, as it's been explained to me, is that the Department of Public Works is happy to provide a line, a, a new line striping plan for this section of Route Two, if De Martin is comfortable on including the cost of that restriping within the construction budget for this project, which I believe he's willing to do. So I, I would imagine that condition could just be that you know the line striping efforts on Route Two as required by the, the City Department of Public Works are you know incorporated into this. Uh, project and, and need to be completed in, in conjunction with any kind of CO uh, at the end of the project. Isn't that included in the supporting of supplemental materials that are already part of the documentation for the yeah. project? So it would be a finding, yeah. you can just do it as a finding of fact that that is the plan. Um, and Got it. then, you know, if it doesn't happen, violation. Perfect. Um, yeah. Sound good? Yeah. Well, the only question left is whether we want to put in the possibility of landscaping as a future in front of the loading area, which is left as just, a, just as an advisory or as a, you know, if it's an option, it's an option yeah. without making it a necessity. Mm -hmm. And then if you can figure out a way to do it, do sure. that would be nice. If it doesn't work out, that's bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would that be language on the landscaping and then the lighting change? Yep. As long as the boards, I mean, okay, I don't know if you want to have the condition I suggested about the demolition or not. It doesn't have to be, but I thought it made sense. That's also in supplemental. Uh, yep. The, Repair shop building itself, I don't know, but all the hazard stuff is documented as part of the application. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, the bottom line, the site plan will be more functional than it is now. So it's an improvement. Yeah. It may not be the improvement we want, but it's definitely an improvement. Improvement will not probably also include some changes to the road. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's a never ending discussion. I want just, to we could just get lost on that. Take the Berlin exit and wait until you all together. Here you go. Let's get out of the and just have box trucks in town. You want to go all the way to Maine? <laughs> <laughs> Don't come through River Street. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll accept a motion. However, once folks want to proceed here.
Alex, would you like to do the motion? You have the landscape concept. <laughs> I have notes on the two added yeah, okay. things. If whoever wants this, I have some notes. I don't basic. think I've ever done one of these motions. Oh. Um, time like I the present. Move, my move to grant the request for minor site plan approval with a waiver to the loading area location requirements allowing a loading zone in the front yard as presented in application number Z2024-0050 and supporting and supplemental materials subject to the following conditions of approval. One, demolition of the auto repair shop shall comply with the deadlines and hazard prevention requirements of section 3004.DA through D. The two, the pole lights on the south shall be shifted to comply with setback requirements. And three, the owners shall have an option, should they so choose, to plant additional um, screening material to screen the loading zone from the sidewalk. That's okay. good. Second. <laughs> Motion by Alex and a second by Catherine um, to approve with conditions. Um, Kevin, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Um, Alex, how do you vote? Yes. Catherine? Yeah. Uh, yes. Joe? Yes. And Rob votes yes. Uh, that is unanimously approved uh, with conditions. You're good to go. Okay. okay. Well, Thanks. not quite. No, not, not quite. <laughs> there is. A... There'll be a written decision, um, and since none of these were prior to permit issuance conditions, um, the permit will get issued with the decision because mail has been iffy. And you guys are nearby. Do you want me to email you when those are ready to be picked up? Yeah, sure. That's okay. Um, because yeah, mail getting it out and then back in is a little crazy sometimes. And uh, there's still a 30 day appeal yeah. process. And there's there's a 30 day day appeal process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody, you know, we didn't didn't have any comments. So I can't imagine there'll be much, but you'll get uh the blue notice card to put in the window and um, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. Yeah, you're welcome. Must have been a stroke of luck that property coming in. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. It's got a long history for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for your time tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Michael. And I think Eric was on for a little bit too. I think I saw a right there. Um oh, okay. almost thank you. Oh, oh thank oh, you very right. much. Okay. Yeah, we do have we do have our other applicant on. Oh we do? Oh. Yep. Jamie came on while we were in process. So uh okay. uh Jamie, I'm gonna um change your name on here so that um people know who you are. There we are. Did it say John? Or John, <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's my legal name. So you'd rather have it John on here? No, Jamie is my Jamie's my okay. nickname. <laughs> okay. Well, they're both on the application and the packet, so yeah. we're good. <clears throat> <clears throat> All righty, we will move on to the uh, 14 Vine Street uh, application um, for a two parcel subdivision. Um, and um, Jamie uh, is going to be speaking. Anyone else on the Zoom going to be speaking? Uh, looks like no, uh, just Jamie and the board. Yes. Um, okay, we'll just swear you in here. Um, uh, all those interested in providing testimony on this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in as a witness? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Meredith, you want to just give a brief update? I know we did this at Sketch Plan. Uh, not a lot has changed, but um, we'll refresh ourselves of the, where we're at so it's a two parcel um infill subdivision with um the potential for 
Um, new development on what will be a vacant parcel. There's a shared driveway. So um, there's a, um, you know, access easement shown on the, the plat. So for that part to actually um, become effective, uh, an, an access easement will need to be recorded in the land records as well as the subdivision um, permit and plat. Um, but this one's, you know, this one's not contentious. They're not moving anything. It all fits in. Um, so I didn't require the actual language of that easement in the um, application, um, especially because it doesn't, we're not having to deal with like um, utility easements, whereas other times we've had that issue as well. Um, but it's it's pretty much the same as it was before, but we have, you know, clearer application materials with the separate site plan versus the um, draft plat. <coughs> change um, and they did widen the showing on the site plan the curb cut so it shows that it can comply if um, you end up needing a commercial driveway in the future once the actual future development is proposed um, but there's no requirement that, that get built anytime soon because there's no application to actually build anything on the vacant parcel and the plat gets registered to the lead records after we approve it. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 They have 180 days after the um, permit is issued to record the final subdivision plat. And it never expires once it's recorded. Correct. Once it's recorded, it doesn't expire. Right. Um, all right, Jamie, you want to give us this overview from your standpoint? What's what's changed in sketch plan? Uh, any major points? <clears throat> Um, I think there were just a couple of things that, um, you had asked for me to clarify or modify, which I did with, um, Rick Bell, the surveyor and, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's been, it's been a few, a few weeks. I don't exactly remember all of them, but, um, I'm sure that we did everything that you asked and, um, uh, yeah, I'm just hoping that that's what you guys find. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, I guess there were two major things we talked about. One was the um, um, access easement, um, and just which is shown on the plat here. I think it was before, which mm -hmm. is making sure that you understand the process for um, just getting the easement memorialized um in the land records um so the actual um easement language um yeah. recorded deed you know clearly giving the rights to both lots as necessary yeah yeah, um, yeah i understand yep um and then we had a couple um i guess comments one was we're gonna remove the proposed uh building um from the plot um and I think we tend, Meredith, setbacks aren't something we usually show on the recorded oh, plat. That... We have language in our regulations that mention that setbacks on a plat are, are fine. It doesn't actually mean anything because it all depends on when a proposal is right. filed. I, I think it's fine to have that on there because it helps yep. clarify a potential building envelope at the time sure. of recording. Yep. Okay. Um. So that's that's no issue. Um, and then I guess I had one question of whether um, that we need to <laughs> note on the plat uh, of its location in the river hazard area. Um, I know it's like, you know, that we don't have to show the line or anything like that, but just. Well, so we've had some to so the, the, it's different. if you're in the floodway or if you're in the, have river corridor, those definitely have to show, um, you know, because the Loma is getting recorded. You know, it's, or not recorded, but the the loma is recorded, and it's part of the application. That is giving us um, a 
clarity on the existing house. Hold on one second. Let me pull up a map because I don't, I think the whole, isn't the whole, the whole parcel is in. Yeah, the whole parcel is And in. so there's no line to show. No. Um, hold on one second. Because I know if it's, if it's floodway or river corridor, those lines should show, especially because of recent legislation. Right. Um, all right, <clears throat> and then, so it's going slow. So the structure is not in the floodway? Well, Am I no, well the, so the structure, because of the LOMA, mm -hmm. FEMA has determined that the structure is elevated above the base flood elevation. So it is not um, considered, it is considered to be outside of the jurisdiction of our river hazard regulations. Okay. Okay, the building itself. Oh, there actually is a flood plain line on the corner. Um, so I'll share this. Hold on so that Jamie can see too. Um, and what I'm going to probably do is just double check my river hazard regulations in that one. It's fun learning on the fly. Yeah. Um, I've got another one that will be coming before you guys where they do have to show the river quarter line and the floodway line. Those are different and higher risk than just the river hazard. So there is a line right there where there's one little corner. <laughs> that's outside of the flood plain or what we call the river hazard zone. Um, so give me a second. I'm gonna pull up and take a quick peek at my, there's a whole section in my river hazard bylaws how does on that, subdivision. Uh, how does that jump off the weather? Oh, you're asking Jamie? Yeah. Just pull your microphone forward so he can hear you ask Jamie. Hi. Jamie? Yes. Um, what kind of uh, uh, outcome did you have with the flooding last summer on those properties? Um, I don't think anything in the meadow got flooded except down by the, the four four way stop sign down there. Spring Street, um, Spring, Spring, and uh, Elm. Yeah, I think it that was the extent. I don't. E I don't even know. Um, I think that's where the water stopped. Mm -hmm. um, we did have some sewer backup issues in some of the people's basements right. that had like open sewer type situations. But yep. um, yeah, we were, I think pretty much all of the meadow was spared. Hmm. It it pretty much started right at Spring Street, and then um, that seemed to be have been the line, um, like right at the four corners there. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. So specifically, floodway and river corridor lines need to be noted because, um, you have to have enough land on a parcel. Um, that's being created to have sufficient areas outside of those locations that are suitable for development. Right. But just being in the flood plain because right. there it's easier to develop. You just have to elevate the new structures. You don't have to worry about sure. um, the river moving and uh, eroding underneath. And you don't have to worry about um, the like higher intensity water, which is what the floodway and not blocking that. Like in the floodway, you can't fill. You can't make it so that water raises other places. So right. that's why those two areas are a very specific concern. Neither of those have to be here. So I, you, there's going to be a, there's, I'll be issuing a separate river hazard permit for the subdivision. So those will all be reported together right. in the same place. So they'll see that there's a river hazard permit and a subdivision permit next to each other. Right. Um, cool. That so. was my only concern actually, that suppose nothing happens for five or six years and then somebody comes into it once to buy the second property, it shouldn't be hard for them to find out. Yeah. 
it's that there is for every subdivision that is in the flood plain, which covers floodway and river corridor, all need a river hazard permit. Um, of course, you know, we haven't done any of those until after Audra retired and after the flood, and now we're dealing with them. <laughs> so, um, so it's been an interesting learning curve. Um, but yes, those will have permits. Those will get recorded at the same time um, so that they're right next to each other in the records. Okay. Um, list here. Um, we discussed the sketch plan briefly about um, um, overhead wires, um, utilities um, being overhead versus underground. Um, we've got a provision in our regulations that sort of says subdivisions, they should be underground, but um, Precedent of the board has indicated that that's really more for brand new subdivisions um, and not infill and in, in new neighborhoods. Um, I think that um, as we have in the staff report, we've got a screenshot of a bunch of overhead utilities <laughs> right in the neighborhood. So it makes sense to do whatever uh, un above <clears throat> ground, underground, whatever utility company so chooses to do. Okay. And then um, as typical for this type of infill subdivision with landscaping and screening, we've um, sort of kicked that to, um, you know, the site plan, the development of the parcel um, versus, uh, you know, doing it um, at the time of subdivision, uh, you know, not knowing exactly uh, how things are going to be laid out and what, um, what may happen. So um, board members feel the same. Um, and then, you know, infill in the city traffic and, um, you know, suitability for, um, you know, public services. Um, I think we, as we discussed at check, sketch plan, uh, anything, uh, this type of, uh, <laughs> activity is, uh, very encouraged, um, rather than, um, um, you know, a concern whether there's enough facilities or, um, whether it should, should not happen. Um. Yeah, I don't, um, we pretty set at sketch plan. Um, and, um, you know, the big things are the, the, the easement, um, and then uh, you know, the removal of the building and envelope or not the building envelope, but the proposed, uh, 45 building that doesn't need to be on there. Um, and, uh, I don't know, I'm still stuck on the, uh, <laughs> on the, on the river hazard thing. Uh, I guess we would, we, we President start having that on. Well, so I just to, so bottom line, just understand where I'm coming from. You know, it's like, it's newly required that, you know, anytime you buy a parcel, you know, you're disclosed that, you know, it's in the flood area. Um, it would just seem to be, make sense for us that we're creating a new lot that the document that creates the new lot has it printed on that, you know, this is in the flood hazard area. Um, we don't have to plot the line specifically. I think just to, you know, a note to stating that the entire parcel falls or portion of the parcel falls or however um, they want to do it. But I think it just makes sense for a standard for us to be requiring that. But you're thinking that as a process change for, uh, DRV as opposed to a uh, condition here. I think uh, we have the, I don't know, I would think we have the ability to I'd say it's that it's a condition. It's, it's not incorrect and yeah. you know, information. I think it's just a just good use of judgment on our part. As opposed to what Mayor suggested earlier, which is that the, the flag gets filed. Yeah. Filed. <laughs> I think that's that's obviously you know sufficient, but you know as someone that has done land records researched and you know go around ultimately you know someone wants to buy this property they get a copy of the map it's like okay where's the boundary line they see it and they should have all the you know the critical information necessary in order to understand 
you know, what the parcel is and what they can do with it. Um, so it could be something like a river hazard permit is filed alongside this plat. Or, I mean, what would it be if it's not our authority? I mean, so it could be a note, right? Yeah. One of the notes that says, um, you know, just like you have other easements recorded or unrecorded may exist, somewhere in there you also have a, you know, as of the date of filing, this land, you know, these parcel, this parcel or these parcels, however you want to put it, this land includes, you know, the, this plat includes lands that are covered by the special flood hazard area. Something like that. Yep. that just puts them on notice because the other thing is, those boundaries can change. That's what I was going to say. It should say as of, you know. Right. As, as of the time of recording, yeah. this, yeah. you know, th these lands include mm -hmm. land that's that's um, within Montpelier Special Flood Hazard Area. Right. Now, is that's in um, the plat itself? I would do that as a note on the plat itself. I f if that's where you guys are going. I would do that as a note on the plot itself so that even if the, somebody doesn't have the recorded permit or the decision, they've got it's in another place as well. Because it is true. Sometimes people all they have is the plot yeah. that they were given when they bought the property and the lawyers have everything else. Yeah, well, then the lawyers have a job to do. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, that's a whole nother thing. I did that in another life. <laughs> um so that would be a different, you know, condition. Um uh, for um, so you could do that in condition two, yep. um, and final plat before it's recorded, and a note shall be added, acknowledging the plans include special flood hazard. Something along those lines. And Rob, is that the kind of precedent that would suit you? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's, yeah. Yeah, that can become just a sort of a standard condition. Yeah. If, if it's not already on the plat where, like you will see one later where they've had to designate the floodway line and the um, river corridor line. And that way I know too, yeah. right? For future ones. Sounds good. Okay. Um. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of conditions here. Um, I guess just one added. Um, and um, have any other questions? <clears throat> I don't. I think I, I don't see Joe, so I don't think he has anything to add. <laughs> so would uh, no. gladly accept a uh, a motion. Yeah, I could start a motion. I might need a okay. reinforcement on the we got a way. Yep, I just added it to um oh, condition two. Sounds good. So I'll make a motion to approve a two parcel subdivision at 14 Vine Street, including memorialization of a shared driveway and access easement as presented in application Z 2024-0043 and supporting and supplemental materials subject to the following conditions. Within 180 days of this decision, the applicant shall record the final survey plot in the Montpelier Land Records Office per the procedures detailed in 4405 of the zoning regs, including the locations of all applicable survey rods and markers. The proposed 30 by 40 building outline shall be removed from the final plat before it is recorded, and a note shall be added acknowledging that the land includes a special flood hazard area as of um, the is of date of this filing. Yeah. Um, the access easement referenced in the final plat shall be memorialized in a document recorded in the city land records. Second. All right, the team today. <laughs> a motion by Catherine and a second by Alex. Is there any discussion on the motion? Okay, Kevin? Kevin votes yes. Alex? I... Alex, yes. Yes. Catherine's yes. Joe? Yes. 
righty. Uh, Bob, Chair votes yes. Um, unanimously approved with conditions. Awesome. Okay, Jamie, I will Great. be working on the decision as okay. soon as the, um, because none of these were again, no, no before permit conditions. Um, um, when the decisions drafted and signed, we'll have that in the permit for you. Um, okay. And then, yeah, there's some conditions on what that final plat needs to look like. Um, so there'll be a few tweaks that Rick will need to make, but you should be able to move okay. forward promptly. I will let you know when those are ready. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Yep. Um, I lost the top of my copy of the minutes in my. <laughs> Here. I think I even had a spare. If you just you make edits, I'm going to need it back. <laughs> um, trying to recall the last meeting. It was so long yeah. ago. I had a revision to the minutes. Are we already there? Yes. Yep. There's a reference to 1 p.m. that should be 1 a.m. Oh. Okay. That was the one. <laughs> yeah. no, yep. First page or second page? Oh, okay. I know. Yep. I want to protect you. the New Year's Eve celebration <laughs> <laughs> and be after it, obviously. So, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to make a motion to approve the minutes with that change. Catherine? I have to confess, I never found the minutes. Here, you want to take a look? <laughs> so sorry. They may be there <laughs> after like, the end of all those staff reports, but I, I never. I don't know where how there. <laughs> it's so weird. Hmm. Every once in a while, the system just sort of freaks out on us. That was a new one, though. Um, I could kind of hear you guys. It says, uh, it looks like it's just a typo before the 1 p.m. It says four Saturday nights per year instead of year. Oh, the year is misspelled? It's just, it's missing the Y. Oh. Okay, so two, two typos. Don't trust spell <laughs> Also needing to remind myself, even though it's paper that then gets thrown away, I have to print it out when I print it. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So we have a motion with um, two uh, amendments to spelling and a time change. Um, is there a second? Sure. Motion by Catherine, second by Kevin. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Are you ready for a motion? <laughs> we are. That we adjourn. Second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to adjourn. Meetings adjourned unanimously. Thank you. <laughs>